Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size. University of Sussex with Jamie Ward, author of The Student's Guide to Cognitive Neuroscience and The Student's Guide to Social Neuroscience. Hi, in today's Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size, I'm going to be talking about how words and concepts are represented in the brain. So we can think of the brain as having something like a dictionary, also called a mental lexicon, which stores the meaning of all the words, how they are pronounced, how they're spelt, and how words are used, such as as a noun or a verb. When we look at a dictionary, we understand the meaning of a word by looking at other words. So uh, the meaning of a word like power or green is defined according to other words. The problem with this is how would we ever really know what any word means if we're just defining it according to other words? This is also called the symbol grounding problem. So one philosophical experiment along these lines is imagine Mary, a colorblind scientist. Mary can't experience or see colours, but she knows everything there is to know about colours because she's read everything about colour on the internet and in books and in journals. So would we say that Mary does really know everything about the meaning of colours? Does she know what the word green is if she hasn't experienced itself? Of course, this seems like a, a silly kind of experiment. We've kind of done it with things like ChatGPT. So ChatGPT has absorbed all of the internet uh, in the form of words, and it knows everything there is to do about colours. But does it really understand what a colour is? We would probably think not. We, we kind of imagine that the brain is very different from uh, something like ChatGPT, and also something very different from like the, the sort of uh, written dictionary that we're all familiar with. So what is it that the brain's actually doing? When we think of how we understand the meaning of a word like green or colours, um, the idea is that we are thinking about our experiences of the world. And of course a dictionary doesn't have experiences of the world, and nor does ChatGPT. But we as human biological agents do. We move around the world, we have experiences, we have memories. And our words are to some extent tagged on to these kinds of experiences. And this is one key idea about how semantic memory is structured, is that it's not like a dictionary of words that are all connected, but rather it is grounded in our uh, perceptual experiences of the world, our, what we see, what we hear, our feelings in our body. So we also often talk about embodied cognition, embodied semantics, that we understand things through the way that it makes us feel. And again, dictionaries and computers don't have feelings like we do, so the, the way that they represent knowledge is very different. This model by Alan Allport, which shows one way which we can think about how words are represented in the brain, is a good way of visualising this. So the meaning of the word telephone would be distributed in many systems, but because telephone is something that you enact, that you pick up, uh, it's something that you hear, it would be um, represented strongly in parts of the brain to do with hearing um, and um, actions. And other concepts might have different properties. So something like a cloud, you can't touch, you can't manipulate it as a tool. So this would be more of a visual uh, or more abstract um, concept. Of course, not all of our words um, are concrete things. So uh, a word like justice, for example, is not something that we can easily see. But the, the idea here is that even abstract uh, words might have some basis in uh, experiences and in concrete things. So if we take a word like power, we can understand power in terms of physical energy. So the amount of force that you would exert in order to move something. But then we can apply that in an abstract way. So we can talk about a light bulb having power, or we can sort of talk about political leaders having power. And again, we're not talking about physical power here, but we've abstracted away from that. Uh, and of course, some words might be defined in terms of other words, but if all words are defined in terms of other words, then it's hard to know how we can ever really understand anything at all. 
what I've said so far, you would imagine that the brain would be a highly distributed system for representing the meaning of words. And indeed, that does seem to be the case. So although we think of some aspects of language as being a left hemisphere function, the meaning of words seems to be highly distributed, including across both hemispheres. But nevertheless, although the whole brain might be engaged in elements of uh, conceptual processing and semantic memory, it doesn't mean that they're all doing the same thing. Uh, and this fits with the kind of idea of grounded semantics, that, that actually different parts of the brain might be doing different things, depending on which aspect of the word meaning is implicated. So if I um, say words to you such as lick, pick and kick, then where are these words in the brain? Using fMRI, there's good evidence that actually when you hear the word lick, that you're activating parts of the brain involving the motor cortex, specifically the motor cortex to do with the, uh, the mouth and the lips. When you hear the word pick, you're also activating parts of the, uh, the motor cortex, but here perhaps more to do with the hands. And kick, again, you're activating parts of the motor cortex, but to do with the foot and the legs. So this is providing uh, good direct evidence for the idea of grounded and embodied uh, semantics. And we can also see this with regards to the um, other senses as well. So if I say the word cinnamon or garlic, these words are activating parts of the brain to do with your uh, smell cortex and taste processing. If I say the word telephone, um, it will be activating the auditory cortex more than a word such as cinnamon, for example, because telephone has an auditory association with it. Similarly, if I ask you to think about the colour of a, the word like taxi, so our taxi is yellow, well they are in places such as New York, but here, although I'm just presenting you with words, your brain is responding in parts of the brain that are involved in the perception of colour. So words can trigger um, something like mental images uh, of colour. So here we have good evidence that um, the semantics is a distributed system, but it is using parts of the brain that are involved in perceiving and in actions uh, and so on. And this includes things like tool use. So hearing a word like hammer will activate parts of the brain that are involved in um, understanding how one grasps a hammer uh, and uses it how the hammer moves, uh, and so on and so forth. Of course, semantic memory also needs to be flexible and dynamic, because words have nuanced meanings, uh, and again, concepts are really kind of a, a cluster of many different features. So, for example, if I show you a picture of a bird and ask you, what is this called? Well, you could say it's an animal, you could say it's a bird, or you could say it's a robin. So there are multiple words that could uh, belong with that concept, depending on what exactly it is that you're wanting to convey. In this example, we would say that we had superordinate knowledge, which would be that it's an animal, and then we would have uh, subordinate knowledge, um, the, the particular kind of instance of that, whether it's an eagle or a robin. What we find is that certain parts of the brain seem to be involved in whether or not you're processing uh, a word at the, the subordinate versus the, the superordinate level. So again, brain imaging studies have done uh, studies along the lines of what I'm just describing, where you present images uh, to people and you ask them to either categorize it, say, as an animal, or you ask them to name it at a fine level, saying it's a robin or an eagle. What you find is that there is a, a kind of an axis along the, the temporal lobes, such that the most anterior parts of the temporal lobes are involved in um, more fine-grained distinctions. So knowing whether something is a, a robin versus an eagle, whereas more posterior parts of the temporal lobes are involved in knowing that it's an animal versus uh, a vegetable or uh, a, a tool, for example. Um, so again, the parts of the brain that are involved in semantic memory are distributed, but also they're contextually dependent, depending on what exactly, uh, which parts of the concept are, are salient at any particular point in time.
If semantic memory is highly distributed throughout the brain, then you would imagine that if you had damaged the brain, it would be hard to remove semantic memory because if you damage one part of the brain, you're not going to take away the whole of semantic memory. You would have more isolated problems. And this is often the case that sometimes if you damage certain parts of the brain, you might lose or impair your understanding of tools versus other kinds of objects. So you, you can kind of have um, fractionations uh, of, of semantic memory when you damage certain parts of the brain. Nevertheless, there are some patients who have brain damage who seem to have a global degradation of semantic memory. And this is somewhat problematic for the idea that semantic memory is a highly distributed system, because if that's the case, then you should only find that if the whole brain is damaged, not particular uh, isolated regions. In particular, there's a condition called semantic dementia. So as the term dementia implies, this is a progressive disorder where patients, typically elderly patients, uh, become worse over time. So whereas Alzheimer's disease uh, is focused on the medial temporal lobes, uh, semantic dementia is a form of frontotemporal dementia that is particularly affecting the temporal lobes. Notably, um, when you do studies uh, with uh, MRI looking at the amount of grey matter, we find patients with semantic dementia have reduced volumes in the anterior temporal lobes in particular. Other forms of frontotemporal dementia might affect the frontal lobes more than temporal lobes and not be associated with problems in uh, language and semantic memory, but more with changes in personality and behaviour. So what is it like to have semantic dementia? So uh, people with semantic dementia can talk in sentences, they can speak fluently, but when they're, they're speaking they might not be able to use um, uh, words um, to, to denote things. So they might use the word thing or it. Um, so if they are trying to describe what they see outside of their window, they might say, oh, it's one of those things, it's got four legs, I don't know what this is, um, I saw one of those yesterday. Um, so it's as if they're struggling to find uh, what the words are. Similarly, if you show uh, pictures of animals uh, or other objects to patients with semantic dementia, they might be able to tell you that that's an, uh, an animal, that's a piece of furniture, but they can't tell you that that animal is a camel or that that animal is a, um, a chicken, uh, for example. So it's as if that they've retained some uh, superordinate knowledge of what an animal versus an inanimate object is, but they've lost the fine-grained details uh, in their memory. So it's, uh, it's that they've actually lost the concepts that, that um, separate one animal from another or one concept from another. It's as if all concepts become uh, somewhat merged together. Um, what, the way that this is understood is that rather than having a fully distributed semantic memory system, uh, there is one model that's called the hub and spoke model that argues that actually there is a hub for semantic memory which is located primarily in the anterior temporal lobes. The function of the hub might be as a, a kind of a binding mechanism to pull all the different parts uh, of the semantic uh, memory network together. It might also be important for uh, other forms of categorization, like remembering exceptions. So knowing that a, pe a penguin is a bird, for example, is quite a tricky thing because it's not a prototypical bird that uh, it can't fly uh, and so on. And again, there is evidence for this in that patients with semantic dementia have particular problems with concepts that are um, irregular or don't fit a common pattern. So they might have particular problems with understanding concepts like a penguin and less so with uh, more typical birds like an eagle. Um, so other parts of the semantic memory system, the spokes that are involved in perception, embodied cognition, might be largely intact in semantic dementia patients. So they can understand some generalities around the world, but they lose the specific details uh, that the anterior temporal lobes seem to be important for binding them together uh, and also making sense of uh, exceptions and irregularities in our conceptual system.